Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'm Vemba Pezo Dizolele, a senior fellow and the director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We are delighted and honored that you could join us today for this candid conversation on the state of democracy in Kenya. I would like to remember our audience that you can submit your questions through the questions and answer link on the event page. Our guest today, His Excellency William Ruto, needs no introduction. He is the Deputy President of Kenya and the contender for the presidency in the upcoming elections. Karibu Washington, DP thank, Ruto. Thank you very much, Mbemba. You are welcome to make your remarks and tell the audience what's on your mind today. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, I much appreciate the fact that uh, you have made uh, this platform on CIS available to us uh, and more particularly available to the people of Kenya. Um, I'm in Washington for a couple of appointments because um, the relationship between Kenya and the United States is uh, a, a a wonderful relationship. We have recently, in 2018, elevated that relationship to a strategic relationship, which um, gives us the latitude to do more as, um, uh, as nations. Uh, aside from uh, my engagements uh, with government, there are also engagements on matters to do with uh, the programs we have in Kenya involving farmers, including matters to do with how we can better grow our economy, how we can, how we can do things better. And speaking about the subject you have mentioned, the state of democracy in our country, Kenya is um, sitting in a very hostile territory. Um, many of the nation states uh, around us uh, are, are states that are struggling uh, to be nations. And uh, we stand out and it puts a lot of pressure on Kenya uh, to remain stable. We believe that it is the democratic culture that will underpin and guarantee uh, the stability and the progress of not just Kenya, but of the region as well. And um, that's why 9th of August is a very important date for uh, not just Kenya, but for the region. Important because amongst the things that will be on the ballot is our democracy and whether we are moving forward with it, or we succumb to the forces that want us to go backwards. I will tell you there are three things, in my estimation, on the ballot on 9th of, uh, of August. On the ballot will be a referendum on our constitution. The 2010 constitution that was built to be the most progressive in our region, complete with a comprehensive bill of rights. Today is uh, on the ballot because uh, there are those who belong to our school of thought that think that we have a wonderful constitution and whatever is remaining, the challenges that are there is on completing the implementation of that constitution. Our competitors on the other side um, believe that 
uh, the constitution we have is not serving as well. And they have proposed a raft of amendments, close to 72 amendments, completely to reverse um, the, the progressive constitution that we have. And uh, I call these people counter-reformers. The second item that is on the ballot this year is our political culture. The decision that Kenyans will be making on 9th of uh, August will be, is this about leaders and positions and power? Or is it about the people, their empowerment? and their progress. That's what is on the ballot. We believe very strongly that this election should be about the people. It should be about the empowerment of the people. It should be about what is in it for the people. We've had elections about leaders and positions and power, and they are never satisfactory. That's what makes our politics very high octane. And the final item that, in my estimation, will be on the ballot is our economy. And the question people in Kenya will be asking, who does it work for? Um, when I listened to President Biden the um, day before yesterday, and he made a fundamental statement, trickle down doesn't work. That is a position we took before the US did. In fact, I, 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 uh, we, we already discovered that trickle down never worked. So what is on the ballot is the people who believe we should continue with a trickle down economic model that benefits a few people and leaves huge sections of our population behind. Or those of us who believe that it is time to reimagine our economy and make it work for the majority of the citizens of our republic. And um, our bottom up economic model that seeks to create inclusivity, that seeks to create and expand opportunity, to create jobs, to build enterprise, to improve productivity in our agricultural sector, and to create an inclusive society. These are the issues that will be, in my estimation, on the ballot on the 9th of August, and it will determine the way that election goes will determine whether we are consolidating our democracy and moving forward, or we are denigrating from the gains we have made, and so by so doing, engaging the reverse gear. So that's where we start. Thank you very much, Deepu Ruto, for your remarks. This will set up our conversation pretty well. I think this will be helpful in laying uh, the basis of our conversation. So you've laid out a number of issues that we'll tackle in the course of this conversation. Talk about strategic relationship with the United States, engagement with your programs, the stability or lack thereof in the region, and the role that Kenya will be playing in that space. You also talked about what is on the ballot this time. So our question will actually revolve around some of the issues that you've raised. So first, let's discuss, uh, discuss democracy in Kenya. Many people around the world uh, remember the wholly, hotly contested, violent uh, general elections of 2017. The elections reveal the schisms in Kenya's electorate as well as the identity politics of that country. Fast forward to present day, and Kenya's general elections are less than six months away. You are one of the main contenders for the presidency. I'd like to hear about your thoughts on democracy in Kenya, 
how has the Building Bridges Initiative attempted to restructure the state and has it succeeded? What are pros and cons around the recent election law that permits the grouping of party coalitions? Can you describe successes and failures of recent effort toward voter registration? How are misinformation and human insecurity threatening democracy? I think some of those issues are all about the pillage just laid out. So, please, sir. Well, um, granted, we've had challenges with elections. And that goes to the heart of what I just spoke about. If we focus on leaders and positions and power, we will never have a peaceful election because not every leader will get the power they want. Not every leader can get the position they want. And that is why we are saying this time round, we have to focus on the people. What is in it for the people? And when we discuss what is in it for the people, jobs for four million Kenyans who do not have jobs, access to credit for 15 million Kenyans who are today blacklisted on credit reference bureaus. People who have access credit today at anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 percent a year. Productivity of farmers. How do we uh, get our farmers to improve their productivity? Milk, for example, from three four kilos to 15, 20 kilos. Coffee from two, three kilos per bush to 10, 12 kilos per bush. That's the conversation we want to have. And that's why uh, my brother Musalia Mudavadi and Moses Wetangula, we came together because we were brought together by the focus of what is in it for the people of Kenya. We need to focus on the things that matter to the people of Kenya. It will never be possible to create enough positions for all the leaders. It will never be possible to share the power to the extent that everybody wants shared. But it is possible for us to share prosperity if we focus on ensuring that we have a much more prosperous country. And therefore, Talking about the Building Bridges Initiative, I do not think that there was a single bridge built. In fact, every bridge on site was destroyed because, because of the BBI process, a, 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 a fraudulent um, political experiment that left the country worse than before it was started. Because of this uh, BBI conundrum, we do not have a government or the opposition. When you mesh the opposition into government and government into the opposition, you end up with a system of government not known anywhere in the world. It's not a monarchy. It is not um, uh, a democracy. And as a result, the BBI process and the sister handshake destroyed the opposition by co-opting the opposition into government, compromising the oversight responsibility, constitutional oversight responsibility of the opposition. It destroyed the governing party. You may want to know that the governing party that had close to 180 members of parliament has degenerated to almost a quarter what it was and has put 
the party leader of the ruling party in a very awkward position. That today, um, the party leader of the ruling party that had a majority in parliament is today a squatter in the opposition. Destroyed the big plan we had for the transformation of our nation. A plan that had youth empowerment, a plan that had um, uh, agricultural transformation, a plan that had universal uh, health coverage, a plan that had manufacturing, value addition, agro-processing, was shelved. And in its place, this monster whose only uh, attempt was to do the wrong things. Number one, to try and recreate an imperial presidency, something the people of Kenya fought against for 30 years. Because once you have an executive or a president that controls the executive, controls the judiciary using the ombudsman, and controls the legislature using appointment of executive mem members into uh, the legislature, you have an imperial president, complete, like it was. There would have been no need to have wasted 30 years fighting for a new constitution if we wanted to end up at the same place. Okay. And, 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 and by so doing, we, we ended up with uh, four years wasted down the drain, not implementing the plan, the great plan we had upon which we were elected. And uh, fortunately, um, the whole charade was stopped by, by the courts because of the imminent danger of uh, uh, threats to the independence of the court itself. So, um, uh, so, so we completely, f uh, th that whole experiment on BBI failed and failed the country and costed the country enormously. Uh, speaking to um, the, 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 the issues uh, you have mentioned about uh, 2017, up and until we accept that there is only one way in a democracy, that we all go to elections and a Democrat must be ready to accept the outcome of an election. The moment you reward um, bad manners, if I may, then you are building grounds for impunity. And, and that's the message part of the message that I discussed with officials here in Washington, that every presidential candidate must be made to commit that they will respect the will of the people and they will respect the outcome of the election. I have done it publicly. I am waiting for my competitors to do the same so that we can have a free, fair, peaceful election. Very good. Thank you very much, Deepu Iruto. I want to follow up on a bunch of uh, points that you raised. Um, one, you know, for those of us observing Kenya, it's not always about 9th of August. It's about the day after. And Kenya politics build around alliances, these alliances, sometimes they're ethnic, sometimes they're regional, sometimes they come in all kinds of forms. It appears that the elite um, have failed to deliver for the people of Kenya. The alliances, maybe it's, it's what you said earlier, it's about being a leader and not necessarily delivering for the people. But there's also some issues that have been, you mentioned the constitution and what should be done. You mentioned graft, uh, fraudulent, to use your word. Uh, it was fraudulent, the initiative of the BBI. My question is two, twofold for now. One, you have been in, power, in, uh, in politics for a long time. You have an impressive resume. You've been Minister of Home Affairs, Minister of Agriculture. You've been Assistance Minister in the Office of the Presidency. Now, of course, uh, Deputy President of Kenya. 
how do you see your role in everything that you've described? Because you've been part of that elite that was part of it. Another element, so when you use the word fraudulent, what I hear is a word that I don't like to use very often because it's so broad, but it's corruption, it's mismanagement of resources. Uh, and then the other word you'd mentioned early on about the constitution, the court. There's an element, an elephant in the room. So as an outsider speaking with fellow Kenyans and also speaking with people in Washington, 2023, you know, uh, 20, 2003, pardon me, and the elections and the ICC. So you were indicted, but the charges were dropped. That has left a, a lot of discomfort in many quarters, as you will know, of course, I'm not telling you anything new. Your fellow countrymen or women will wonder, well, what, how will things be different, uh, different with P.P. Ruto? Those of us outside, your friends, the friends of Kenya in Washington, and as elsewhere in the world who like to see change are wondering the same question. Would you address those issues of weak alliances or driven by different things? Your own experience with the ICC and how people may conceive it and see how people are worried about the future of justice in part because you come from the same system that you're denouncing today and which is the way forward. Thank you very much. First, is um, you have said I have been part of the system. To a good extent, yes. And I can account. And that's what gives me the track record upon which the people of Kenya will assess my candidature. I was Minister for Agriculture and my record in my performance at the Ministry of Agriculture is something I'm very proud of and the people of Kenya know it. And it's part of the reason why my candidature is very viable. Same thing to do with my record at the Ministry of uh, Higher Education. And same thing in my uh, um, position as Deputy President. My contribution to the progress and development of Kenya is built on a solid uh, track record. And the people of Kenya, in their um, entirety, are a very intelligent people. They, they, they know uh, what to choose. And I am no stranger. They, they know what I can do. Uh, and they, 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 they have a, a, a good account of my track record as a public servant. I think let's leave that there. My experience with ICC, I am a very strong believer in the belief of innocence until you're found otherwise. And to our record, President Uhuru Kenyatta and I submitted ourselves to the process in ICC. We didn't run away. We didn't escape. We, we submitted ourselves to the process. And the process itself cleared us. So um, there are many innocent people who are taken to court. Being taken to court doesn't demonstrate any guilt of whatever nature. So um, I, 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 I thought you should be uh, uh, um, looking at it positively, that this is a man that is willing to submit himself to the rule of law. And that's my position. And that is why I can comfortably tell you, seated here, that I will respect the outcome of the election, whichever way it goes, because I am a believer in the rule of law. I am a believer in constitutionalism. And if anybody brought whatever challenge my way, I would deal with it within the parameters of the, uh, of the law and, and the rule of law and, and, and international justice. And maybe uh, 
finally post-2022. Uh, I am very confident that uh, August 10th, going into uh, after the election, uh, Kenya is going to be peaceful. Okay. I, I am very confident. And um, uh, the people of Kenya, um, I believe, will do their thing. They will elect the leaders of their choice. And Kenya will, 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 will walk into the future confidently. Very good. Thank you very much, D.P. Ruto. We're going to move shortly to our next segment, which is the economy. But I just want to come back to this. Why are you running? I am running because I have a plan. And I have a contribution to make to my nation. I have been in public life. And I, and, I, and I know what clarity in leadership, being able to make decisions, the correct decisions in politics, can change lives. When we came, let me give you examples. When we came to office in 2013, we had 2.3 million people connected to electricity. By making deliberate, very simple, deliberate decisions. We have moved the number of people connected to electricity from 2.3 million to 8.5 million. Very simple decisions. Um, we have, uh, when we came into office in 2013, we had 11,000 kilometers of paved road in Kenya, tarmac road in Kenya. By making clear well thought out decisions on how to continue that journey of uh, making sure that we have uh, a robust infrastructure around road and rail. We have doubled in 10 years the number of paved roads that were done in 50 years. So I am a great believer that Kenya can change in our lifetime depending on the decision makers, the policy makers, the people at the helm who can make the right decisions. Okay. And I am very confident that I have what it takes, not only to make the right decisions, but my team and I have a solid plan and a solid track record of performance that the people of Kenya can vote for and that we can use to transform our nation. Very good. We'll be hearing about that plans in the next segment now. Um, your econ the, I would like to hear about your economic vision of Kenya, mm -hmm. right? So for Kenya. Before COVID-19, Kenya was one of the fastest growing economies in Africa with an annual average growth rate of 6%. The pandemic hit the economy hard, like everywhere else in the world, and led to increased unemployment. Mm -hmm. But Kenya is one of the fast recovering countries on the continent with an expected growth rate of 5% uh, in 2022, 2023. There is job growth, particularly in industry and services, but agriculture output is waning and partly due to climate change, rainfall, uh, um, uh, reduced rainfall, but also some of the issues that you had mentioned earlier, corruption and others. So my question is a few of them really. What are your views on threats and opportunities for the Kenyan economy? How should the Kenyan government support employment in tech, including effort to strengthen the ICT enabling environment? What are opportunities for increased trade and investment? And what is your vision for Kenya's engagement in the African continental free trade area? Does the bilateral US-Kenya free trade agreement discussed under President Trump come into conflict with the AFCTA? And finally, what are your thoughts on the African Growth and Opportunity Act? We'll start with those, and then we'll come back for another. Quite one. a bunch, eh? Yes. Uh, you are running for office. <laughs> <laughs> Kenyans want to know. <laughs> and we want to know in Washington. Um, OK, let me begin uh, where you started, yes. right? And that was, um, what do I see? 
what 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 are the opportunities what are the what are the challenges we have tremendous opportunity um, uh, in, in the whole space that we, we currently sit. We build a base, a solid base, uh, in our first term. We have a robust infrastructure development at the moment, 700 kilometers of new standard gauge railway, 10,000 kilometers of tarmac. We have a robust electricity connection around the country. We have built a, a solid um, uh, education and training uh, facilities including what we recently concluded about 150 technical training colleges around the country to equip our young people with skills and competences. So we have laid a firm foundation which in my opinion is an opportunity. We also, um, uh, because of that foundation, there is huge opportunity in our young people in the democratic uh, demographic dividend around our young people. We have among us the youngest populations, we have among us the best uh, uh, trained and very educated uh, population. Depending on what you do with it, it can either be a challenge or it can be an opportunity. I, tr I, I, I want to consider it an opportunity and that is why uh, in the plan that I see Kenya going, we will be deploying resources to ensure that the infrastructure we are building is labor intensive. And in my estimation, the four million young people out of college, school, and university, that is an opportunity we need to tap into by making sure that we engage them. So job creation, when I talk about job creation, I'm talking about deliberate job creation. We will invest in sectors that deliberately uh, create jobs so that we can turn the challenge of young people into an opportunity for us to grow our economy. We have a comparative and a comparative advantage in agriculture. Um, just for your information, for every one flower sold in Amsterdam, one, one flower, for every four, one comes from Kenya. So we have a serious uh, competitive uh, advantage on matters to do with milk, coffee, tea, horticulture. Much as we've been hit by the pandemic, there is great opportunity for us to increase the productivity of that sector. I see a great opportunity if we put sufficient resources to make sure that we have access to fertilizer, access to uh, credit for farmers, access to new technology for our farmers. We will double, if not triple, earnings from that sector. In fact, in my uh, estimation and uh, working with my team, we believe that milk can actually overtake coffee and tea and horticulture if we dealt with um, matters to do with the cost of feed for our livestock. Kenya is the largest producer of milk, about 5 billion liters every, every year. So I see opportunity in, in some of the challenges that, that, that we have. I see great opportunity in uh, um, universal health coverage uh, as part of our plan. We know many families go straight to uh, being destitute just m uh, with one sickness. In fact, it is normally said many families are one sickness away from poverty. The, uh, that challenge, if we turned it around and uh, with the interventions that uh, we have made and hopefully, now that we have changed the law and we will make uh, contributions to our universal health coverage kitty to be graduated depending on incomes, we should be able to increase by between 200 and 300 percent the uh, contributions. And we should be able to turn around 
our our health insurance uh, facility and it is and, and with it we can be able to not only save lives we can save incomes and we can have a better healthier uh, population that then becomes much more productive Okay. Thank you very much. So, the deep so I, I see uh, both opportunities and challenges. And just to mention one, one thing, the trade negotiations that are um, ongoing between Kenya and the U.S. will be a, a very big opportunity that I see. And uh, it's one of the issues that uh, was on the table of discussion between my team and uh, uh, the State Department. And also, um, Kenya being part of the East Africa community and the Africa um, uh, continental free trade area, those are added opportunities that can um, help us grow uh, and expand our economy. Thank you very much, DP. So one question, I would like to beg your indulgence. We can make it short in response okay. so we cover mm -hmm. foreign policy. Maybe you can also make your, your Yeah, yeah, your, it's not, this your question be shorter. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> fair. That's the fair trade, right? <laughs> so the economy, Kenya's economy is heavily agriculturally based. It's a powerful economy. It's a big one, uh, 100 plus billion dollars in GDP. Mm -hmm. But it's not working for the youth. You referred to the youth in passing. It's heavily also saddled with debt. So two things. How you mean to address this? because you're kind of shortly, and then two, the next president of Kenya will need to bring tremendous discipline because there's a fiscal crisis looming. I did not mention youth in passing. I, have, I think I have mentioned youth here more than 10 times. Youth is at the heart of our plan. Whether you're talking about uh, the job creation initiatives we are, we are, we are, we are, we are looking at, whether we are talking about uh, access to credit, majority of the young people don't have, cannot access credit. Startups have no access uh, to credit. Many young people, as a last resort, get into farming. So um, back and forth and in the middle is the young people of Kenya because we have a very young uh, population. Um, discipline and debt, that, that is at the heart of this conversation. Maybe you may wish to know that for the first time in Kenya, we have forced a conversation on the economy. All along it was who gets what, who gets what position, who gets access to what power. Today, the conversation in Kenya is about the economy. When you hear mama mboga, border, border, the, these are economic units. The, these are people, players in the economy. And we are replacing discussions about the economy away from discussions about this tribe and that tribe and this community and the other. And I am very confident that another two elections discussions on economy, we will have dealt a big blow to ethnic politics in Kenya. Thank you very much, DP Ruto. Um, so we'll enter our foreign policy segment of this conversation. We'll take about five minutes through this, and then we'll go to Q&A, because there's a lot of people waiting to engage with you from the audience. So <clears throat> turning to our final topic, um, let's talk about your vision, the diplomatic vision, the outward vision, particularly Kenya's role in the region, particularly also in the international community. Early on, you mentioned the tough neighborhood that Kenya finds itself in. It's always struck me a little bit that Kenya is it's a regional power, but it's somewhat timid and reluctant to play its vocation on the international stage. That has changed a little bit with the crisis in Somalia, the crisis in Ethiopia, and the Great Lakes region where Kenya is also engaging. We have five minutes, let's talk about how do you see Kenya's involvement? You talked earlier about strategic engagement, your trip here in Washington. Um, it stems from what I told you earlier. 
for Kenya to play its rightful place as a member of the international community and deploy the status we have around the region. At the heart of it is the stability of Kenya first. And the stability of Kenya is built on how democratic Kenya is. Political democracy and economic democracy. That we have a nation that is at peace with itself by building a broad-based coalition like the way we've done and building a broad-based economy that leaves nobody behind. That's the beginning. And going into uh, our, what we can do in Somalia, I think we have made huge sacrifices as a nation to keep that region um, the way it is. We have huge uh, burden of refugees. We have um, the accompanying terrorist uh, challenges that come with uh, refugees and a region that has very weak governments. And Kenya has played its role in that space by making sure that we have provided leadership in AMISO. We've contributed trips, uh, troops in AMISO. We've played our role in IGAD. We have played our role in South Sudan. In fact, we are the single uh, country that has, uh, uh, that actually midwifed the, the, the birth of South Sudan as a nation. And I agree with you, the posture we have as a nation is, 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 is slightly of a lower uh, caliber than it should be. I believe that Kenya can deploy its uh, diplomacy much more effectively in a much more creative and innovative manner. And working with uh, our other partner states in, in the region and uh, uh, in the continent, uh, we believe that we can play a significant role in uh, making sure that we have a peaceful, a peaceful region and a much more stable uh, Africa. You may want to take cue, for example, from the statement that was issued by Ambassador Kimani on Ukraine. That tells you Kenya's robust position on matters to do with the security of our globe. And we can confidently speak out uh, for Ukraine because we are used to a difficult neighborhood and we are used to bullies who sometimes uh, want to overrun other countries and challenges uh, that uh, countries uh, face. It is my position that um, we should be uh, able to see an amicable solution to the Tigray challenge in, in Ethiopia. We should be able to complete um, the, 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 the peace negotiations in, in South Sudan. And it is our considered view that uh, the elections in uh, Somalia must be brought to an end. It, we cannot have an endless election timetable that has no results, whether it is four and a half or four and a quarter or four and something. I think it must come to an end so that we can consolidate a government in, in, uh, in Somalia that can then work with the international community to stabilize Somalia and to begin the journey of creating uh, the nationhood of, of Somalia. So from South Sudan and uh, in, in North Sudan uh, or the main Sudan, our position has been, and I think that should be expedited, the transition from a military regime to a civilian authority that has uh, um, the people's mandate as opposed to uh, what is going on at the moment. And uh, maybe to look at how we can stop the shifting goalposts, you know, that there is a tangent and there is a corner, then it, it never quite gets to, to, to an end. Again, as I said, that depends to a good extent on a very stable and democratic Kenya. And um, working with partners like the United States and other um, partners, 
that should be a reality. Thank you very much, DP Ruto. This uh, concludes uh, this part of our discussion. We're now opening it to questions from the audience. I'll read one question for you that has just come. You have stressed the importance of the rule of law and judicial independence in your public remarks. In 2017, when Kenya's Supreme Court nullified the election result, threats against the judiciary raised concern about your government and about Kenya's democratic trajectory. Can you comment on that situation? For your information, I think the nullification of our election was in itself a turning point in judicial independence in our continent. Um, we criticized the judiciary uh, because we, we felt that we had won the election. But our criticism and that criticism. We still obeyed the law, we obeyed the ruling, and we went back to elections. So again, uh, I was told by one good politician when I first became a member of parliament. And they looked at me and I was then a member of the ruling party. He told me, young man, I see you are very uh, robust about your support for your party. But the best way to support your party is to criticize it when it goes wrong. So criticism is not necessarily uh, not believing in, 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 in the other side. It is just an expression. But the taste of the pudding is in the eating. Did we obey the law? Did we obey the ruling? And it said the benchmark for many other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and so um, it goes to the heart of my belief in the rule of law, that we may disagree, but bottom line, we must respect the law. It doesn't matter whether I like it. It doesn't matter whether I don't like it. But bottom line is that uh, we must respect uh, the law. And let me, while talking about the judiciary, maybe it is at this point that I would uh, want to say, for those of us who believe that the way to the future is not to engage the reverse gear and denigrate from our constitution by uh, uh, compromising the independence of the judiciary. Instead, our position is that we should complete the implementation of the 2010 constitution by uh, enacting and bringing into force the Judiciary Fund, which has been the biggest impediment in the independence of the judiciary and the ability of the judiciary to discharge its mandate of making sure that it holds the other harms of government to account and it helps in the fight against corruption. And it is my very considered position that within the first 100 days, of the new administration, the Judiciary Fund should be operationalized to give the judiciary financial independence so that they can appropriate their mandate and be able to discharge uh, their, their responsibility in accordance with the Constitution. And the same goes to the Inspector General of Police and all the other criminal justice arms, that today, though the Constitution says they should have financial independence and have an accounting officer, Today, they still depend on the office of the president to, for financial resources, while the constitution itself says they should, be, they should have their own independent um, budgets and independent accounting officers so that we can truly make the whole prosecution um, uh, investigation independent of manipulation by the executive or indeed any other arm of government. Thank you very much, DP Ruto. I put two questions. One says, what is your, what is your plan to keep peace during and post elections? And then one that is related to this says, elections are largely won through intense mobilization of Mamambogas and Waze Wabodia, Wabodia, Waboda Boda and Mikokoteni. How do you actually plan to integrate them into your vision and uplift, uplift them if you win? <laughs> 
those categories of economic actors in Kenya are actually at the heart of our economic model. So we are not, we are not uh, 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 recruiting them after the election. They are, in fact, an integral part of the discussion we are having. They are the reason why this discussion about uh, uh, the next government moved away from positions and power sharing to the economy, where uh, the people you have listed are, 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 are actors. Um, I agree with uh, the gentleman that uh, uh, it's about mobilization. And even as we are in the US today, uh, we have our teams all over the country making sure that Kenyans are sensitized, we uh, engage them to understand our economic model, and we are doing it differently. Uh, for the first time in the history of Kenya, we are not going to have a, man a manifesto that is discussed in air-conditioned offices. Our manifesto today is being discussed in markets, in, 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 in all manner of places. And before, uh, as soon as our nominations are over, we're going to have a signed charter with every county on their priorities, on the things they want fixed, on the things they want to put in their priority list, on what they want us to do. And, and we want them to hold us to account. That is bottom-up politics. We want every citizen in their corner. They want the prices of their commodities. They want the price of milk. They want the price of coffee. They want the price of tea. They want the price of sugar cane. And they, they want a commitment on how we're going to improve those. They want a commitment on matters of universal health coverage. They want a commitment on the education of their children. And that is the model we have built, a bottom-up political model that will inform the next government. And, and, and that's why those groups are uh, significantly very important in our plan. Thank you, D.P. Ruto. Um, two more questions on this side. One is LGBTQ Kenyans have faced physical violence and death threats. You have made public remarks suggesting there is no room quote-unquote, for homosexuals in Kenya. If elected president, how would you approach the issue of homosexuality in the country? That's the first question. And then the other one, can you speak to Kenya's relationship with China? If you are elected president, how will you navigate great power competition and competing desires from the United States and from China? I will give you my position as a Christian. My position as a Christian is that the Bible teaches us against homosexuality and related matters. That's me, William Ruto, as a Christian. As a public leader and as a servant, the Constitution and the law in Kenya becomes the guiding principle. Whatever is within the Constitution and the law, I will respect. So long as everybody is operating within the law and within what's permissible in the Constitution, they have no, nothing to fear because we are a nation governed by the rule of law. So on, on that point, do I hear you correctly that LBGTQ Kenyans don't have anything to fear in terms of physical violence and the protection of the law? I, I do not think anybody should pick up arms against any Kenyan, irrespective of whether you like what they're doing or you don't like. Every Kenyan must be subjected to the rule of law. If you do not think that any Kenyan is acting in, in, in the right way, it's not for you to decide to harm them. It is for the law to take its course. So that's why I'm saying no Kenyan should be uh, uh, subjected to any form 
of uh, harassment or any form of harm. And the so only authority that can take action over anybody is the authorities that are permissible within the law. And if a Kenyan has not broken any law, nobody should harass them. So as a public servant, we will operate within the parameters of the constitution and the law. And every Kenyan must be safe within those parameters. So there is no, um, there is no exception on, on anybody uh, harming other, other, other Kenyans. On the matter you have said about uh, China and uh, the US, we have a solid relationship with the US. We have interests that are um, uh, that converge between us and the US. That's why, for example, um, two days ago I was in Nebraska to discuss how um, the um, university there and uh, the companies there can work with us on agricultural uh, agribusiness, uh, value addition. They are supplying us with uh, pivots and uh, equipment that are used for our value addition and agro-processing uh, interventions. Um, and, and the interests that are with the US as a nation are very primary to the relationship between us and the United States. We have relationships with other nations because of uh, uh, politics being a nations pursuing their own uh, development and economic interests. And, and we will pursue uh, those interests without necessarily jeopardizing relationship with a, a great friend and, and partner like the United States. Very good. Thank you, <coughs> Adipi Ruto. So there's still one question that I would like to address. We have a couple minutes to go and we'll see if there is any other question coming through. You say that a Democrat must be ready to accept the outcome of an election. Correct. Even if you lose. Correct. Are you willing to accept the outcome of the 2022 election, even if your opponent wins? Yes. A straight yes, with no qualifications. Finally, because, because uh, that's 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 what a democrat is, you know, and and that's the question I want all the other competitors to answer. You know, and and it should be a straight answer, yes or no. Very good. Mm. We have one minute to go, so I'll go back, reserve my uh, chair prerogative. You early on mentioned the Constitution, mm -hmm. and you talk about certain people want to go another way and different school of thought. As the Constitution exists today, you have had a tough relationship with your president. You studied <laughs> as partners. To, that's an understatement, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in 30 seconds, is, what is the state of that, and how does it relate to your position with the Constitution? This is part of the alliance that has been troubling in Kenya. <laughs> I think you've said yourself that uh, it, it's not it's just something that I can answer in a minute. Correct. I mean, it's, it's a relationship built over a long time, over maybe 20, 30 years. So it's not something that I can describe in, 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 a, in, a, in a minute. Um, but just uh, to put it that uh, um, uh, we, we shared uh, uh, the same thoughts. Uh, up until uh, the handshake came about. And when the handshake came about, um, I did not believe that the way to build and consolidate our democracy is by creating two, three positions for um, a few leaders. I, 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 and that's the, the point of departure. I, I believed that building an inclusive economy would actually sort out 
uh, the challenge of ethnicity in Kenya and building um, national political uh, parties and national political uh, coalitions would actually sort out the challenge of ethnicity in our politics. I did not believe that uh, uh, what's currently going on in Kenya, that every ethnic community and every region is being sponsored to have a political party of some sort, uh, is the way to go. I do not believe that changing the constitution to create a few positions would sort out the challenge of uh, uh, ethnicity in our, in our country. And I have no problem creating uh, positions, but I do not think it is the answer. And, and I think that's partly uh, what uh, um, um, informed uh, to, to, to an extent, uh, because I have, I have views. Uh, and and uh, um, democracy means that uh, even though I don't agree with you, I should defend your right to hold that contrary view without necessarily taking uh, any drastic action against uh, one another. So um, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta is uh, my boss and my good friend, although we have uh, different points of view on matters to do with how we want to take Kenya forward. I think, <clears throat> I think what I was driving at, we hope that kind of friction, those differences moving forward, mm -hmm. um, that structure of president and DP will continue, but in the way that is positive. It's been unsettling to see the DP and his president, mm -hmm. one asking one to resign, the other one saying no. You mm -hmm. know, this is part of that entire ecosystem well, I was talking uh, about. I would, I would really, maybe if you get an opportunity to have a chat with uh, President Kenyatta, maybe you could ask him to be less aggressive against me. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe that way we, we could make this a lot better. Very well. But uh, I have taken it in its stride and we are moving on. Okay. Thank you very much, DP Ruto. I would like to thank you for joining us today. I'm sure I speak on behalf of our audience as well here at the Center for Strategic and International studies we're happy that you joined us uh, to our audience i'd like to thank you for joining us also today for your questions for your engagement we appreciate you thank you have a good day thank you very much thank you Mbemba.